Apollo, the buzzer. Welcome to another episode of the JM Report. I am your host, Guru JM, coming to you from CSB Studios in Tampa, Florida, the birthplace of pro wrestling on this March 22nd, 2019. And I hope everyone's enjoying this brain break, at least from this week, as others will have theirs next week and then the following week and so on and so forth. But springtime is here. Of course, many of us can't tell that uh, depending on what part of the country you live in, but uh, it's here. Woke up and matter of fact, it's still a little chilly out here for us uh, Floridians now that I've become one in the past few years from a New Yorker to a Floridian. And uh, this is my this might as well be sub-zero temperatures out here and it's only 61. <laughs> I, I, I got to tell you, still at the time, still getting used to the environment and the, and the climate and all that. 60 degrees in New York, for example, it's nothing. It's like literally a breeze. Out here, maybe not as high of humidity, but uh, you add in a bit of a wind chill and it's only 60 degrees, people just almost lose their minds. We might as well be living in Alaska right now. They, that, that's how cold they think it is. Or it's too cold for them all things considered. So basically anything above 65, it's warm enough. Anything above 110, okay, now it's too hot. <laughs> uh, the uh, the cultures of different parts of the, well, the world, of course, but different parts of this country in particular, all on the East Coast, go figure. But enough about my uh, poor man's weatherman update. Um, yeah. Let's get right into this as uh, Raw and SmackDown continue the storylines into WrestleMania. And some interesting ones, some eh ones, and of course, probably one of the uh, two, actually, of the ongoing main storylines, one, on uh, one on each brand, has a lot of people talking. In the case of Raw, like, what is this? In the case of SmackDown, a hint of... What is this? But at the same time, like, what the hell? And by that, I mean, they're really pissed off. The fans, they don't pronounce, pal. You know, they're really pissed off. So without uh, stalling anymore, let's just run it down bit by bit. Let's start off with Raw. They kicked off with Paul Heyman and Universal Champion Brock Lesnar heading to the ring. And the usual shtick about going to WrestleMania, they're going to destroy Seth Rollins, retain the title, blah, blah, blah. Well, at one point, Paul Heyman pointed out uh, Drew McIntyre that he could be the next big deal, not the next big thing, because that's Lesnar, but the next big deal in so many words, and that he, how McIntyre single-handedly took out two-thirds of the Shield a week prior, that including uh, Roman Reigns and Dean Ambrose, and that Seth Rollins, who had a match with later on that night, was out of his mind because of what he did to his uh, Shield brothers, what chance did Rollins have? So this brought out Drew McIntyre and pointed out that finally someone mentions the, or paid the respects to McIntyre that he well deserved. And you know what? Yeah, he does. He's been a hard worker for so long and it's been a slow build up, and unfortunately not his fault due to other arrangements or reorganizing or scrapping storylines and to, to do another one. He would have been at the top. He, he main evented so many Raws oh, only to uh, main event maybe a handful of pay-per-views in between, but 
it, it looked like he was uh, heavily considered to be one of the next big top heels. But it, uh, again, not so much that he didn't he didn't do anything wrong. Not that he wasn't getting over with the fans. They they respond to him, but I think it's because of other storylines that were changed, and to you know to no fault of uh, no one to be honest. You know, stuff happens and you got to, like, back it up a little bit or backtrack a few steps and hopefully not to lose uh, too much faith in the guy where he can position him where he is now competing near or at the top of the uh, the roster. So McIntyre comes out and, again, acknowledges how he took a Roman Reigns and Dean Ambrose. And then finally, again, earning the respect from Paul Heyman in, in this case, and this brought out Seth Rollins sneaking up from behind with a steel chair and just destroyed McIntyre right on the ramp where he, he, uh, McIntyre never got into the ring and just laid him out. <laughs> and, of course, I'm sure many of you have seen this. This uh, created a new meme. And it, it, it's been seen before, maybe in the background, and then it will do a quick cutaway on television, maybe uh, – in the foreground, for that matter. But again, the, the, the way WWE, the producers, whether it's uh, Kevin Dunn and whomever in the truck that does these crazy cutaways, and they don't always match to what you see as far as, okay, well, he just got punched in the face, and the, the, the angle that they shot was from a low angle ringside, and all you saw was the, uh, the from the waist up of the two wrestlers. And then you cut away, and it's a close-up of their heads for some reason. Or you cut away, and it's from a longer distance from the hard camera. Or you cut away, it's coming from the rampway. Like, it's like, who, uh, what the hell's going on is my first question. My second one, who the hell hired the three blind mice to produce this thing? And my next question, and hopefully the biggest one, would be when are, when are they getting fired? Don't need to get me started again with the zooming in and out seizure uh, effect that they do. But anyway, back to this meme that was created. As uh, Rollins was just nailing McIntyre with the, with the chair as if it was a railroad spike. A fan from the, from the opposite side of the car, hard camera who uh, was sitting uh, ramp side or ringside but on a ramp side. And just shot McIntyre being destroyed by the steel chair. Meanwhile, you see the cameraman filming what we all ended up seeing from at home is the up and down camera shot as, as he was following the steel chair being raised and then smashed back on McIntyre's back. But in actuality, it's literally the cameraman going up and down, shaking the camera upward, downward, up and downward, up, like, like, like he's a freaking bobblehead with a camera attached to his shoulder. And again, it's been seen before, but not to this extent. It was just so crazy. I don't know how many shots Rollins gave, maybe a dozen more or less. But the cameraman, to his credit, he followed each one. But at the same time, to some people, especially to me, like, well, this style of editing is a joke. And it's even more so when you see how it's done. I couldn't imagine what's being said in this guy's earpiece. But, you know, it's not his fault. He's, you know, he's doing what he's being told to do. That's his job, to get certain shots, uh, certain angles, certain positions, you know, the whole nine yards. But <laughs> if you haven't already, it's on YouTube. Uh, Seth Rollins uh, beating uh, Drew McIntyre with a steel chair, plus the WWE cameraman in the background. It, it is just hilarious. But, of course, McIntyre gets laid out. Rollins makes, makes eye contact with Lesnar, who, who's still in the ring. And uh, Rollins makes, makes a beeline for the ring. But Lesnar and Heyman, of course, spot out. And nothing to do. No one, nothing to do with Rollins. Not now. We got to wait till Mania. So this segues, literally, as Rollins leaves the ring. Finn Balor makes his way to the ring. And was going to be teamed up with a secret opponent or mystery opponent, even though the commentators already gave it away. But it was Braun Strowman with Finn Balor teaming up to take on Bobby Lashley and Leo Rush. And I believe this man, this might have been the first time that uh, they did a split screen with Raw 
uh, for those who follow SmackDown, when they go to commercial, they do it like a split screen and or picture or PIP picture in picture pip. If you got a cable uh, cable box that does that, um, you got Raw in the smaller screen in the upper left hand corner while the commercial is taking up the rest of the screen on the right hand side. I believe that was the first time. Could be wrong, but it's the first time I seen it, and that was the only time they did it on this broadcast. What? Okay. But anyway, uh, the match itself was uh, pretty entertaining, I, I got to say. And Strowman did not appear on SNL this past week as it was preempted. And uh, Leo Rush, poor guy, gets caught between The Rock and The Hard Place. But The Rock and The Hard Place are called uh, Finn Balor and uh, Braun Strowman. As Strowman was setting up about to charge like a bull to uh, basically spear Rush through the... Uh, barricades near the, time, the, the near the timekeeper's table as Finn Balor was holding Rush up. But on the other side of, of ringside, we see Bobby Lashley instead spear Finn Balor out of sight. And as Strowman was charging at the same time, Rush and Balor are out of the picture. So Strowman ends up spearing Lashley over the barricade into the crowd. So at this point, Lashley's out of the match, out of the picture. And this leaves Leo Rush sacrifice to get the hands of uh, Braun Strowman, who, who delivers a power slam to poor Leo. As Strowman gets the pin and the win for his team with Finn Balor. We see Ronda Rousey backstage arriving with her husband, uh, Travis Brown. And they're really showing a camera together, let alone backstage, uh, walking around hand in hand. But I thought that was very interesting. And she's informed by referees that first that she arrived late, and second that the because of the fine that was handed down to her last week for an undisclosed amount from uh, attacking officials, that that from now on, at least on this night, should be escorted by security, no matter where she goes, uh, ringside, uh, roaming around backstage, in catering. I would assume should be with security at all times along with her husband. And Ronda just shrubs it off as this, you know, didn't really say anything, just like gave this whatever attitude expression and just kept going while the referee is still explaining the rules of, hey, you still need security with you. <laughs> Cut away and we get a moment of bliss, a moment with bliss. Is it with bliss or of bliss? It's Alexa Bliss's talk show, reminding us once again that she'll be the host of WrestleMania this year. And her special guest this time was Elias. And the fans were popping big for the guy uh, as, as Elias announces that he would be the musical headliner for WrestleMania this year in the greatest city of all, New York City. This, this gets a few boos, not so much because they're in Chicago, but more so that WrestleMania this year is not in New York. It's in freaking New Jersey. Anyway, as Elias was about to threaten anyone who dares to interrupt him during Mania, he gets interrupted again, only this time by the entourage of Noah Jose, led by heavy machinery. As Elias was confronting Otis about the interruption, he then gets attacked from behind by a masked individual, which many have pointed out uh, either it looked like or it was a replica mask of Pentagon Jr. I unfortunately didn't catch it the first time, and by the time I got done taking down my notes, I had already deleted my DVR recorded uh, Monday Night Raw this week. So anyway, turns out that the masked individual was No Way Jose himself, a bit of payback from last week's attack from Elias to No Way Jose. And this leads to a match. And the entourage, ringside, try to hype it up as much as they could. But unfortunately, the fans, they could care less uh, about this feud, if, if anything. And there was little to no reaction. But Elias would win with his uh, drift away as he gets a three count over No Way Jose. As Elias leaves the ringside, we literally segue into Kurt Angle making his way down to the ring as the entourage was still ringside as Angle was going to announce his opponent for WrestleMania 35. As the Kurt Angle farewell tour continues, he surprisingly, and he had a good explanation, I'll give him that, but he surprisingly picked uh, Baron Corbin to be his final opponent at WrestleMania. And almost immediately, and, and I think the commentators even picked up on this later on in the show, because if it's not a pay-per-view 
or a special event going on that's televised, they rarely, if ever, mention on on the graph on the, on screen that Raw was trending or that WWE was trending specifically. And that caught my eye right away, and I wanted so I so I looked around and came up with a few uh, comments, a few or reports that are already being uh, uploaded. And yeah, the WWE, you know, keeping it, you know, kayfabe a little bit, are responding to how Angle could could choose of all people, Baron Corbin to be his final opponent, where there are other more worthy people. Now, on the flip side. Assuming this is what's going to be the end game for Kurt Angle's last match on Mania, uh, this is a great opportunity and time for Baron Corbin, not not, not only to be at WrestleMania in a one-on-one match and not disappear among the crowd during a battle royal, but against a high-profile Hall of Famer legend in Kurt Angle, win or lose, he could brag about being the guy that, well, I was in Kurt Angle's last match in the WWE. Or I dare say his entire career. So basically bragging rights, in short, for a long time. Now, I suggested last week it should be John Cena. And many, many fans seem to have uh, cried out the same or for the same to to take place. John Cena one-on-one with Kurt Angle and Mania. Uh, I think there's still time. I think what they did here with not only the mentioning during the broadcast, I'm like, oh, this, you know, this is going on world, worldwide of uh, Angle choosing Baron Corbin and the backlash and this and that. And it was designed that way from WWE to intentionally go out there. This is what I believe. I didn't read this anywhere. But I believe this is what, there was, what it was done intentionally to go out there and make Angle announce Corbin as his final opponent and just have the people just shit all over it. Like, Why? Because it's built up, it's WrestleMania. It's thank thank goodness it's not a two month two month build up from this point. It's only about what three weeks from now, so it's less time to get aggravated and you know a little pissed off about this. But I think at some point it's going to change. It may or may not be Cena, but I don't believe at the end it's going to end up being Angle and Corbin at Mania. I don't think so. If I'm wrong, I'm wrong. But in my gut, I just got that feeling. It's all just going to be just a, a, a swerve for the sake of swerving because, you know, you, you got to do that now, now, every now and then, bro. But uh, uh, I, I just hope they don't do what they've been doing. And Oh, and by the way, you know, Baron Corbin, really, the, the guy who's been, you know, back to kayfabe, the guy who was blamed for the low ratings late last year to have the McMahons and Triple H come out and say, well, we, we heard your cries. Uh, no more uh, authority figures, no more this and that. The what the hell are they on TV? You are now the authority, WWE Universe. Uh, no, not really listening. <laughs> more or less, but no, they're, they're not really listening. <laughs> Don't know how much of a uh, storyline change that they had to do because of that public announcement in their characters, not as themselves. When they finally came out and realized that, okay, you know, you made a lot of noise and we have no choice but to acknowledge this. But yeah, Angle choosing the guy who's blamed for how Raw is in the can as his last opponent. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm dwelling too much on this, but yeah, definitely and hopefully this will change sometime soon. But as far as this night goes, Kurt Angle goes one on one with Chad Gable. A uh, bit of a dream match here as there were two former Olympians as Gable uh, looked up to Angle as one of his heroes growing up. And it was great to see that it was Chad Gable, the Olympian, as, you know, American Alpha member, not Chad Gable, Bobby Roode clone. As uh, Gable put back on his singlet, the old red, white, and blue, as Angle's red, white, and blue, and touch of black, or trimmed with black, as uh, Michael Buffer would say. But, uh, Bit of a slow-paced match. It didn't really pick up towards the end. You know, uh, Angle, I think, I would assume he's uh, saving all the big stuff for Mania. But uh, it was great. Uh, visually, it was great to finally see these guys in the ring. It definitely would have been 
awkward as hell to see it was Jason Jordan to accept the match because, you know, father and son, how could they wrestle? But unfortunately, Jordan can't wrestle anymore due to his uh, injured neck. But he's still working backstage as an agent. So everyone's uh, things are working out for everyone. But uh, Angle would counter the ankle lock on Gable to get the win after a tap out. This, co- this of course, brings out Baron Corbin and trash talks Angle about the match of Mania and that no one else will remember the career of Kurt Angle but the very last match he ever had. And if that's the case, please change the opponent from Baron Corbin to anyone else. You know what? I should be careful what I say. <laughs> we don't want to end up seeing Kurt Angle taking on Mojo Rowley at WrestleMania after Mojo gets done yelling at himself in the mirror. Backstage, we see Baron Corbin again conversating with uh, the Revival. And then walks in Apollo Crews. And Baron Corbin finds out that no one likes him backstage. Apollo Crews pointed it out. Corbin even asked uh, the Revival, hey, people like me, don't they? And they just start laughing and couldn't look at him in the face. So being part of the storyline moving forward with Kurt Angle, uh, Angle might use this as a little bit of adding uh, wood to the fire or fuel to the fire, depending on your preference. But I I just got this gut feeling. It's not going to be Angle versus Corbin, not Mania. Sasha Banks and Bayley, the WWE Women's Tag Team Champions, are interviewed in the ring and confirmed that they have accepted the challenge from the Iconics for SmackDown the next night. And just as Sasha was going to announce potential opponents for WrestleMania, out comes Natalia, and she introduces Beth Phoenix. Both women enter the ring, and Phoenix has come out of retirement to team up with Natalia and to challenge for the Women's Tag Team titles at WrestleMania. Sasha points out that uh, uh, Natalia is riding the coattails of Beth Phoenix in order to get a title match. In response, Natalia just slaps Sasha in the face, and we get a bit of a brawl here. But this leads to a match one-on-one with Natalia versus Sasha. During the match, Nia Jax appears on stage causing a distraction in order for Tamina to come through the crowd and uh, superkick Beth Phoenix, Bailey, and Sasha Banks, causing a disqualification. And we just might get a multi-women tag team for the women's tag team titles at Mania, but I'll get into that later on. Speaking of which, we see Mojo Rally backstage once again in the, at a mirror yelling at himself, basically saying to figure that out. So we got Batista yelling to give him what he wants. Now we have Rowley here to figure things out. Ricochet went one-on-one with uh, Jinder Mahal, the former WWE champion with the Singh brothers at ringside. And pretty good uh, match. Uh, I'm, I was a little surprised of uh, what Jinder Mahal was able to pull out here. Basically what Ricochet was able to get out of Mahal in this match. Uh, I'm just, is anyone as tired of that particular rest hold where it's kind of like a half chicken wing, half chin lock, or something like that. McIntyre does it. Mahal does it. I think even now Lashley's doing it. Uh, it's just... Okay, f- for the sake of rest holes, can you switch up the move at least? Maybe a chin lock or, I don't know, an, an actual arm bar, but, th- but a different variation so you won't piss off Ronda Rousey. Um, but anyway, Ricochet hits his 630 for the win over the former champion, and it was reported, and I believe this was still the case uh, even at this point in time, uh, Alistair Black and Selena Vega won their honeymoon, hence why uh, his absence on Raw and SmackDown, Alistair Black. So they were married uh, late last year, and only recently have they shared uh, wedding photos, I guess to uh, uh, pretty much give the... uh, the excuse, I guess, for them not being on television. Like, well, we're on a honeymoon. And this is why, you know, we, we, we tied a knot. So kudos and congratulations, Mazel Tov, all the jazz for Zelina Vega and Alistair Black. We find out who will be the new recipient of the Warrior Award this year for the Hall of Fame. And it goes to longtime WWE employee Sue Aitchinson. Uh, who has contributed so much to the company for over 30 years. 
uh, in particular with uh, Make-A-Wish. I will have a little bit more about uh, Miss Sue Aitchison later on, but uh, congratulations. And um, this is, I believe, the first ever WWE employee that's receiving the Warrior Award, which was uh, suggested by the Warrior himself before he passed during his Hall of Fame speech. Uh, but he had a different name for it. It was the uh, Jimmy Miranda Award. And I'll also get into that a little bit as well. So it's good to see that finally, uh, us, at least from the fans' perspective, and not that there's been many backlash from it, but people were questioning it. You know, it's great that everyone else, the, uh, the, the previous recipients, you know, uh, they, they, they deserve the recognition that they uh, received and to be placed on a huge stage like the WWE Hall of Fame and put out there the good word to raise awareness. It's all for the, you know, the, uh, the common good or the, or the greater good, as, as many would say. And I'm all for it. But uh, I'm, I'm just pointing out the fact that this is what the Warrior was originally speaking about. And we're finally getting it this year for the Hall of Fame of 2019. Ronda Rousey makes her way to the ring with, without security escorting her as she is set to defend the Raw Women's title against Dana Brooke, who finally gets her shine in the, uh, the main stage here. So as the two combatants get ready to, uh, to brawl, the referee explains the rules, and the bell rings, and then the bell rings. As Ronda Rousey immediately places Brooke into the armbar for the tap-out submission to retain the women's title. And then, uh, I guess you could say, uh, a little bit of hell breaks loose. Ronda, after the bell rang, refuses to release the hold. As more referees come down, uh, a couple of officials come down, they, they break it up eventually. But then comes out the security that was, should I guess, should have been a little closer or at least on the stageway to escort Ronda Rousey out of the building. But Ronda makes his way out of the ring and she walks over to the time timekeeper's table where ringside her husband, Travis Brown, was sitting. And as they were, you know, a little bit of smooching there, and but security was still waiting on Rana to, well, hey, you got to go. You got to leave now. Rana did not take well to that and slaps one of the security officers. And even Travis Brown got a shot in on, a, on another security officer. Brown then literally picks up his wife over the railing puts it down, and they both leave to the crowd backstage, never to be seen or heard from again. Chances are this is going to lead, as Ronda continues uh, ranting on Twitter, not caring how many fines, not caring how many security guards, and all this stuff that WWE is doing to her. It's going to make her stop heading to WrestleMania and just lay in the, the ass-whipping that she believes uh, Becky Lynch and Charlotte Flair deserve. Uh... I guess we're going to eventually see Ronda Rousey leave the WWE for how long? We don't know. But I guess it depends on the exact circumstance, storyline-wise, that she would be let go of the company. Because at this point, Ronda's undefeated for over a year. She's become women's champion, somewhat uh, surrendered it, only to be giving it back to her a week later. So she never lost the title. And... Uh, basically faces the, the biggest challenge of in, in her short WWE career, that being a triple threat match. Curious to see how she would have done in a Elimination Chamber match, in a Roar of Rumble match, and a Survivor Series match. I mean, you know, these different types of uh, gimmick matches that other women uh, put themselves through, but she just hasn't, or maybe this was all the entire deal all along before she debuted at the Royal Rumble in 2018. And it's like, hey, I'm just going to give this a little whirl. Uh, I got plans to do. I got other commitments. And uh, I go out with a bang. Curious to see if the heel turn was part of that. But, you know, sometimes you do got to go with the flow. And, and, and it adds more. There, there was really no turning back once the fans got heavily invested and behind Becky Lynch. Uh, there, there was nothing Ronda can do or say other than what she ended up doing and some heelish tactics to even up the, uh, the the scale, so to speak, to balance that out of heel versus face. And, of course, you got Charlotte Flair in there for reasons. As a result of earlier, 
Apollo Crews pointing out of Baron Corbin that no one liked him. We had a match between Baron Corbin and Apollo Crews. And interestingly enough, it's Apollo Crews who gets the victory here. And uh, well, he, he basically uh, countered the end of days into a small package for the pin and win. But if, if <laughs> this goes back to what I was discussing earlier, if Baron Corbin is need to be taken seriously as Kurt Angle's final opponent at WrestleMania, it's not a good start to pick up momentum and to look strong heading to WrestleMania. Hence, more of a reason that it may not be Baron Corbin as the final match for, for Kurt Angle. But there's still a few weeks left. We'll see what they do here. We get an interview from Batista live from his home office in Tampa, Florida. And said that he never liked Triple H. That he always used him. Just like he used others to get to the top and pretty much keep him there. Uh, everything that they did together was about his career. And that Triple H held him down even back in 2010. Batista promised two things will happen heading towards WrestleMania. That he hopes that McMahon will wake, Vince McMahon will wake up and fire his ass, his, the ass of Triple H, that is. And that Batista would end his in-ring career at Mania once and for all, Triple H's career. And Batista just gets up and storms out of his office telling, yelling at everyone to get out. I assume it wasn't his own camera crew. It had to be a WWE crew that headed out to his office, you know, quote-unquote, you know, kayfabe. Um... One of the main reasons why Batista did not do this in person, or at least in Chicago live, uh, apparently the, the remake of Dune began filming this week in Europe. So even though, I mean, I, there's no proof of this, but there, 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 there were reports that uh, Batista had already flown out to Europe to begin shooting. So this might have been a pre-recorded interview from, from Batista's side of things. And the commentators who gave the questions uh, must have rehearsed the timing on this. I mean, this is, I'm not saying exactly what happened. I mean, for all we know, this could have been legit Batista's house and he flew out. But I'm, I'm just pointing out the fact as why Batista was not in Chicago live for this uh, interview one-on-one. -on -one. But he, Batista also still has commitments. And he's filming the remake of Dune that will... A shoot way past WrestleMania, so probably probably the weekend of if he doesn't have any uh, meet and greet uh, schedules for for Batista, uh, he will literally just fly into New Jersey, head over to MetLife Stadium, do his match, and fly right back out to continue shooting Dune. Similar to what The Rock did uh, when he was shooting with John Cena, and uh, Ronda Rousey had a similar. Yeah, when, when she debuted, she was still shooting a movie, uh, Mile 22, with Mark Wahlberg in Colombia. Like, nah, nah, she won't fly in. Nah, nah, she won't do it. She flew in from Colombia. Made a little cameo. Hi, how you doing? And flew right back out. The magic of Hollywood, I, I, I guess. Anyway. Despite not appearing on SNL after it was preempted, Braun Strowman officially made the announcement that he will enter the Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal at WrestleMania, and is still much very upset at uh, Colin Jost and Michael Shea uh, weekend update. Enter Alexa Bliss as the host. She wants to fix this and make amends between all three men and to give her, uh, she's sp speaking to Braun Strowman, to give her to next week to fix everything as she doesn't want chaos to ensue at Mania as uh, Che and Jost are the... Uh, Special guest correspondence for WrestleMania this year. And Alexa Bliss just doesn't want to see that uh, fall apart. But I wonder what's going to happen anyway. And then it's time for the main event as Drew McIntyre goes one-on-one -on -one with Seth Rollins. But before we get to the match, we see McIntyre challenge Roman Reigns to a fight at WrestleMania. But instead, we get a brawl between Rollins and McIntyre on the aisleway as officials come down to break it up. But we do eventually get to the match after a commercial break as McIntyre showed his dominance throughout the match. And as Rollins was about to set up for a uh, curb stomp, out comes Brock Lesnar to cause a distraction. 
and Rollins eats a Claymore kick, and McIntyre gets a pin and wins. So even the challenger for the Universal title cannot look strong here. It's Drew McIntyre. So uh, going back to my comments earlier about, once again, not being McIntyre's fault. It's just a, a victim of circumstance. And once again, building up the, uh, the momentum for him. Heading towards WrestleMania, which we all know, without even hearing from him, Roman Reigns will accept the challenge and more than likely would appear on this week's episode of Raw to do so. And why Roman Reigns and Ambrose were not on TV this week? Well, they were selling the injuries, to be honest. However, once uh, Raw went off the air, Rollins was still left in the ring. This brought out Baron Corbin for some reason, as he was about to... Uh, beat up on poor defenseless Seth Rollins, but here comes Dean Ambrose to make the save, just to make the crowd go happy, I guess, because, yeah, you got Brock Lesnar causing a distraction, you got the heel going over the babyface hero, who's supposed to be a legit threat for the Universal title, but he loses a match, but we'll leave the TV audience all confused, and unless they actually take the time to tune in for these exclusive footages, on social media channels from WWE, we'll never know what really happened after Raw went off the air, but at least the, the crowd, live crowd in Chicago, they went home happy. And that takes us to SmackDown. As The Miz comes out to open up the show and responds to Shane McMahon's comments from last week after challenging him to a match at WrestleMania. And basically, The Miz admitting that he took shortcuts and that he took uh, a lot of his friends and partners and eventually backstabbed them. And besides his relationship with his wife and daughter and, of course, his upcoming second child, that he has sacrificed everything for his career in a WWE. The greatest moments of his life was when his father, George, stepped into the ring a few weeks ago and told him how proud he was and that he loved him. Others warned the Miz about Shane, that he has run to the core like his father Vince, saying that it took him 13 years to get the respect from the audience and that he will give Shane McMahon the ass whooping he deserves at WrestleMania. And you know what? It, uh, it's been a while since I've seen you know a rerun episode of The Real World or the, uh, what's the other show? The Real World versus whatever challenge and whatnot. Uh, was it Road to Rules, something like that? You could, like I said, it's been a while. So uh, The Miz was always a fan of WWE. And even if he didn't take that route, he didn't walk that path to get to where he is now, there's a very good chance that he would have been successful as a TV personality somewhere. Maybe um, a, a talk show host. So he's, he's pretty good at that. Maybe uh, some kind of a fitness guru. Who knows? But somewhere, somehow successful on an, on a network. And... Like, yeah, after he said it out loud, it's like, well, it's been how long you've been in the company? And he's right. I, I looked back, and sure enough, yeah, part of the uh, part of the uh, Tough Enough cast, the uh, I think it was the Million Dollar Tough Enough that uh, Daniel Puder ended up winning. There were other familiar faces on that show, uh, just like the Boogeyman and uh, Ryback. But... Um, yeah, 13 years is a long time. That's almost as long as John Cena. Uh, so it's safe to say, yeah, Miz is a veteran. He might have earned that title a couple of years ago, but you know, I, I think it's fair to uh, officially call yourself that or be considered that after your 10th year. But 13 years, yeah, Miz, the, Miz has been there a long time. Longer than Kofi Kingston, he's going around saying, well, I've been here for 11 years. Miz, 13 years, holy crap. So... One time WWE champion, but even that was uh, a tobacco with it, itself because the focus was really on Cena and Rock that year, and Miz just happened to be there, just happened to be the champion. But you know what? Yeah, much respect deserved for the Miz here, and I expect to be or well, this match between McMahon to be one of the show stealers, if not the show stealer for WrestleMania. And that they give him enough time to do so. I mean, last year's WrestleMania was, what, 20 hours long? So why should this year's be any different? Bailey and Sasha arrived to SmackDown as the WWE Women's Champion face off against the Iconics. And 
Barely three minutes into the match, we get Lacey Evans do a cameo, walks down to the bottom of the ramp, turns around, and leaves. Thanks for coming, Lacey. And I swear, whatever big push that's rumored for Lacey Evans is worth the wait because she she was absent literally for a week from one SmackDown to another where she didn't appear on television. Uh, I believe she appeared on a couple of house shows, but that's house shows. You know, house shows is really what you test the waters with to see how the audience will react, and then you basically, not all the time, but in most cases, you repeat that on a live audience that's for television. I guess someone's really sticking to their guns, like, no, I'll just keep Lacey doing her cameos, maybe have a match here and there on main event that won't appear on a network for like another month. And yeah, it should be relevant enough-ish. So anyway, back to the match. Uh, it, it was a match like, it, it's a match like this, I should say, that makes you almost forget how good the Iconics really are. Uh, I, I know some people will disagree with the in-ring work, their uh, talents in the ring, which is fine. I, I, I understand that argument, but as heels, as, as annoying heels as they are, uh, making fun of anything and everything that happens before, during, or after a match, and they use that to their advantage psychologically. And they, they did a great job here cutting the ring off. Of course, being annoying is all hell on the microphone, but that's their job. That's what they're supposed to do. And you know what? They're entertaining as all hell. <laughs> when they do their special iconics pose with their two fists on their, on their waistline as if they were superheroes, I just crack up every time they do so. It's just that entertaining to me. But we can argue till the cows come home about that. But, you know, it is what it is. And surprisingly, the Iconics defeat the champions here. A bit questionable, but still get the win over the champions. And this is what leading this is what is leading everyone to believe that for the women's tag team title match at WrestleMania will be a four corners match. The champions, obviously, Sasha and Bailey, Naya and Tamina. Natalia and Beth Phoenix who openly challenge them face to face. And the Iconics who deserve now a title shot after defeating the champions in a non title match here. So more than likely we are gonna get that uh four corners match, maybe a fatal four way match at WrestleMania for the women's tag team title. Rey Mysterio Jr. is backstage being interviewed as he announces that he will face Samoa Joe for the United States Championship at WrestleMania. And uh, he introduces uh, his son, Dominic, all grown up. And he, he's got to be at least a foot taller <laughs> than his own father. As Dominic uh, discusses how much of a bully Samoa Joe has been to his father, Ray. And I had this feeling, and thankfully I wasn't the only one that shared uh, their thoughts on this on social media. No good can come from this. You bring in a family member and your opponent is Joe, in this case, Samoa Joe. Uh, I'm sure uh, Dominic is already uh, of legal age so they can get away with this. Because of the comments of Dominic calling Samoa Joe a bully, how long before Samoa Joe chokes him out? Really make things personal. I mean, he, Joe already did with uh, AJ Styles' wife and his family late last year and how heated that feud was by adding that a spice of... Uh, personal lines you don't cross, but Joe did. Now, Joe wasn't heard from uh, other than the gauntlet match later on, but Joe never commented on what Dominic said, but I'm pretty sure he will follow up on, on this next week on SmackDown. We get the return of the KO show as Kevin Owens hosts his own talk show once again here on SmackDown, uh, sporting a nice-looking uh, blazer and a new uh, KO shirt matching the uh, KO show uh, logo. So yeah, Kevin Owens dressed to the nines here compared to how you know he normally dresses. But anyway, his special guests were Charlotte Flair and Becky Lynch. Before the segment got out of the way, Kevin Owens wished Kofi Kingston all the luck in the world during his gauntlet match. Matter of fact, a lot of people did that throughout this. I forgot to mention that uh, with the exception of Rey Mysterio. Uh, whenever there was a cutaway or an interview backstage, everyone was wishing Kofi Kingston luck to uh, get that title shot at WrestleMania by winning the gauntlet match, but I'll get to that in a minute. As uh, no crutches, 
no signs of limping, Becky Lynch makes her way to the ring. And uh, soon followed by Charlotte Flair. Charlotte basically kept her comments simple and basic that she's going to beat the hell out of Becky at WrestleMania. And before Becky was given an opportunity to respond, Kevin Owens uh, stands up because they had his, uh, basically like a meetings desk in the ring. Owens was sitting dead center to the right-hand side from the camera point of view was Becky and to the left was Charlotte. So Owens stands up and... (laughs) Uh, and so many words says, Becky, I know you have a response to that, to Charlotte Flair's comments, but just a second. He walks out to the apron because he knew, as we all did, what's going to happen. And basically said, Owens did, all right, Becky, what is your response to Charlotte Flair? And Becky teased that she was going to say something, but no, she just drops the microphone and just makes a beeline for Charlotte Flair as a brawl breaks out. Again, no selling of the knee injury anymore. Uh, I don't think Charlotte even went for the knee at, at any time. And referees and officials come down and break up the fight. And it seemed, to, it seemed like it went longer than expected because we, we, we get this another crazy cutaway. Uh, the fight was already broken up. Becky's in the ring and Charlotte was still ringside. But the cutaway just happened as Becky was jumping out of the ring. Now, we don't know if she's going to charge at Charlotte again or if she was going to leave uh, through the ramp as uh, Charlotte Flair was being escorted through the uh, time, timekeeper's table area. So we don't know. But we cut away to a backstage interview with AJ Styles, who, again, wished uh, Kofi Kingston all the luck in the world during his gauntlet match. And the AJ Styles will be heading to WrestleMania not to build but to destroy and bring down the house on Randy Orton. Those are fight words I've ever heard some. WWE Champion Daniel Bryan, along with Rowan, head to the ring. As Bryan mentioned that the gauntlet match is an injustice. So are we led to believe that uh, the conversation he had or the the suggestion that he had for Vince McMahon last week coming out of his office wasn't his idea? Oh, well, this brings out the new day as Kofi Kingston gets ready for his first opponent of the gauntlet match was Sheamus. And the match, uh, I swear, it, it literally started at 9 p.m. Eastern Time on the dot. As Kingston went one-on-one with Sheamus. Kingston would hit the trouble in paradise to get the pin and advance in the gauntlet. We next get Cesaro, who was already at ringside. And during the match, actually throughout the gauntlet match, there'll be cutaways to backstage where it first began with New Day watching the match on a monitor. And then we, also, we see the Usos, and then another cutaway, we see the Hardys, and then another cutaway, we see Heavy Machinery. So basically, the crowd kept growing backstage whenever it cut away during the gauntlet match for Kofi Kingston. Kofi Kingston would counter the neutralizer and pin Cesaro to advance into the gauntlet match. Out next is Rowan, making his way to the ring. However, at this point in the match, it seemed more like punishment as Rowan would just get himself disqualified ringside for using a steel chair. And do the old uh, claw slam or the, uh, do they even have an official name for it? It's like a choke slam, but really it's uh, the iron claw around the forehead. Pick him up and slam him down to the mat. But in this case, uh, Kingston will be slammed through the announce table. And the referees and officials were finally able to uh, make Rowan go away. But as, as that is happening, Samoa Joe makes his way to the ring as his next opponent. Kofi would counter the muscle buster into a roll-up and pins Samoa Joe in advance. Now, of course, you had to see this coming. Joe, it, apparently it doesn't take Joe much to get pissed off as he applies the coquina clutch on Kofi Kingston, choking him out. Once again, more referees and officials come down and break it up. Out comes Randy Orton. And Kofi was at the mercy of Orton. But Orton, Orton would make a mistake taking too long to set up for the RKO as King, Kingston counted him and rolling him up for the win. So Kofi wins the five-man gauntlet. And as per the rules or the uh, announcement or the stipulations, he will get a title shot at WrestleMania against Daniel Bryan for the WWE Championship. New Day come out, Big E and Xavier Woods, they celebrate with Kofi Kingston. All of a sudden, no chance in hell. Is played over the loudspeakers. 
here comes Vince McMahon. And I, <laughs> I love how they did it. And I'm with the fans here, especially so close to Mania. But basically, um, well, at this point, from Bell to Bell, Kofi Kingston wrestled for about 55 minutes. So including the New Day coming out to uh, celebrate, Vince McMahon coming out, making his, uh, his promo that he, that he said in a minute, I'm going to uh, simplify, and then for the rest of the broadcast. He said, congratulations, Kofi, you won the gauntlet match, and you're going to WrestleMania. But only if you defeat this one more opponent. And the crowd was, uh, if this was an ECW crowd, they would have either thrown debris at McMahon or just simply just rioted. Maybe not by today's standards, but back in the day, maybe. <laughs> and the sixth man would be Daniel Bryan himself. And mind you, Kofi is spent. He barely got to his feet, barely got a, maybe a three, three and a half minute match with Daniel. And all it took was the running knee from Daniel Bryan. And at this point, they, they were already at the 10 o'clock mark. So with the new deal with USA Network, I was like, hey, guys, you got to get all your stuff in before the time expires. So I don't know how much it costs, but WWE literally had one minute extra so it was more than enough time for for uh, Daniel Bryan to hit the running knee pin Kofi Kingston get the get the upsetting three count and you see all the upset looks on on the new day barely as the uh, copyright imagery pops up on the corner of the screen and they cut away and it was a 10-01 uh so what happens here is that um uh, there was a scary moment that Kofi Kingston delivered the SOS and landed on his head, but seemed to be okay. And Brian picked up the win, once again shattering the dreams of Kofi Kingston ever getting a championship match at Mania. So during the week, uh, Kofi Kingston was at a uh, some kind of convention, and Big E was at home. They both cut a... Uh, the selfie video posted it online, uh, expressing how upset they were, how cringeworthy this is, this whole situation of how Kingston's being treated. Xavier even teased uh, the New Day breaking up, much like the situation with Becky Lynch and getting her back into the title run. I mean... <sighs> Honestly, that that feud already feels like, and, and we're weeks away from Mania, but it already feels like an afterthought. But the Ronda Rousey nonsense of breaking fourth walls and making the comments that she makes on Twitter and blah, blah, blah. Once they started doing that, it didn't help matters. Matter of fact, once they had their, their fastly match, Charlotte and Becky, well, if Becky wins, you're back in the title picture. She was already in the title picture. There was no reason to remove her, let alone suspend her, unsuspend her, fire her, whatever you all did. Once it became a, a cluster, at least I started losing interest. And other, and other people, yeah, they're still behind Becky Lynch. They still want to get, they still want to see her get her, her triumph victory against all the odds. But it, it began fading for me anyway. But as far as the, the Kofi Kingston uh, similarities, don't be surprised if that ends up being or getting a bigger reaction once we do get Kofi Kingston officially wrestling for the for the WWE title at WrestleMania and defeating Bryan at WrestleMania. It's going to be like a celebration like we've, we've never seen before. Probably not since uh, the late, great Eddie Guerrero, who even then was uh, fighting against the odds. Here is similar, except uh, the difference, at least one of the differences, that Kofi's been with the company for far too long to now have gotten at least a title shot somewhere along the line. I'm sure we did maybe on a Raw or SmackDown episode, but no one's bringing it up. 
at least, uh, I, and I went back as far as I could a few years ago. I, I don't see a, a match in, with, involving Kobe Kingston and a WWE title. With that said, how about we take a look at the updated card for WrestleMania? Of course, as mentioned many times, for the Universal Championship, Brock Lesnar will defend against Seth Rollins. Ronda Rousey will defend her Raw Women's title against Charlotte Flair and Becky Lynch in a triple threat match. Triple H will take on Batista in which may be his last WWE match ever in a no-holds-barred contest. In his final stop of his fellow world tour, as of right now, Kurt Angle will take on his hand-picked opponent, Baron Corbin, in his retirement match. Shane McMahon goes one-on-one -on -one with The Miz. AJ Styles will take on Randy Orton. For the WWE Cruiserweight Championship, Buddy Murphy will defend against Tony Nese. United States Champion Samoa Joe will defend against Rey Mysterio. There is a Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal. The only participant so far is Braun Strowman. And of course, headlining musical act, Elias. Now, there's a little bit more of one-on-one -on -one matches than I thought it would be. But then again, you, you'll probably have those Battle Royals, one for the men, one for the women more likely. And have everyone who could have been uh, slotted in on the main card and just be a part of WrestleMania in the Battle Royal. So far, and I hope they finally do this for the Cruiserweight title, that is on the main card and not the kickoff show. This is one of the, this is one of the many steps that you lost um, Austin Aries, who for all accounts should have still been with the company, at least for another year, but that's just my take on it. Speaking of uh, updates, we, we got a confirmation, as I mentioned last week, by uh, giving minor spoilers. But it was confirmed this week on NXT for a takeover in New York as they gave an update on Tomasa Champa. As his doctor said, that the spinal cord is starting to was starting to compress. With any hard hit, it could lead to paralysis. But post surgery, things went perfectly. Not good, but perfectly. Still no return date for the now former NXT champion as Triple H appeared on NXT this week and officially stripped Champa of the title. And again, mentioned last week a fatal fireway between Adam Cole, Ricochet. Alistair Black, Matt Riddle, and the Velveteen Dream will determine the new opponent for Johnny Gargano, who was already set to face the NXT champion at NXT TakeOver, as Gargano was waiting for the winner of this fatal five-way match, and it was Adam Cole who was victorious and will go one-on-one -on -one with Gargano for the now vacant NXT championship at New York, will take over New York, in a two-out-of-three falls match to have in a Decisive and definitive winner, as per Triple H, for the NXT Championship. And the rest of the card is as follows. As the winners of the Dusty Rose Tag Team Classic, Aleister Black and Ricochet will now take on the NXT Champions for the titles, the War Raiders, Hanson, and Rowe. Pete Dunne will defend his United Kingdom Championship against Walter, going one-on-one. -on -one. For the North American Championship, Velveteen Dream defends against Matt Riddle, which I should, which I believe should be one of the, the show-stealing matches of the night. And Shayna Baszler will defend her NXT Women's Title in a fatal four-way versus Io Shirai, Bianca Belair, and Kyrie Sane. But of course, in the biggest story of the week pertaining WWE, is that they're selling. Their WWE headquarters. They're confirmed by moving their global headquarters to a new complex at 677 Washington Boulevard. Ooh, so close of getting the actual address that they deserve, don't they? 677 minus 11, you know what I mean. <laughs> Which is still in Stanford. So they're literally just moving their headquarters down the road. As part of an official statement by the WWE, uh, uh, actually by the co-president of the WWE, George uh, Barrows, one of the most important elements necessary to execute WWE's long-term growth strategy is world-class talent collaborating seamlessly to create compelling content. 
Our workplace initiative will be the foundation to meet these objectives and underpins our ability to deliver long-term value, said by WWE co-president. The new headquarters will provide the company with workspace suited for its growing and evolving workforce. The site in Stanford's central business district provides greater access for various means of transportation, four plans which are well-suited to producing video content and greater flexibility in workplace design. The company anticipates it will move to the new headquarters in early 2021. So, did Vince McMahon pull a Tony Stark here and sold off the Avengers Tower to move up to a bigger and better facility upstate? Well, it's literally uh, down the road. Um, I'm not sure exactly the distance from the the, new, the, the soon-to-be old headquarters of the WWE into the new one. My only thing on this is that I will never now get to visit WWE headquarters. I had plenty of opportunities, but just never came around to it. I just didn't put the time for it to visit uh, their headquarters and to at least take a, a tour of the lobby <laughs> and um, take a selfie with the uh, bronze statue of Andre the Giant there. But that's all right, I guess. For the new, for the newer generation, a new uh, vast audience that they've uh, created and and developed throughout the recent years, I would only assume a tour will be part of the plans for the new headquarters after everything's settled in and up and running. But uh, we'll see, and I'm curious to see how much bigger this new facility is for the new WWE World Headquarters. Now for some random news from around the world and and pro wrestling. Uh, Jim Ross opened up about deciding to leave the WWE when his contract expired just a few weeks ago, saying, the main reason I, I'm leaving WWE is because they weren't using me very much. I feel like I've got some great years left. I needed to get out of the house. I needed to be involved. I needed to be on the road. I needed to be around people. And so that was the main reason I left. I had no issues. I wasn't mad at anybody. There's no major controversy here. Just the fact that I believe WWE in general, as most television producers do, want to want to get younger. I said, Vince, if anybody could understand wanting to stay in this game, it's you. So I look forward to every day. I've had such joy working with the WWE. My God, 26 years is an eternity in that world. Also regarding AEW. Uh, while speaking to ESPN's Outside the Line, Jim Ross would say, I don't know. We're talking. I just haven't signed anything yet. My people and their people are doing their thing. The only agent I grew up knowing was the State Farm agent in Oklahoma. So I got a real agent now. They're working on that. They're working on it. I'm about to get into some voiceover work. I wouldn't mind having a radio gig doing college football. So there you go, the man himself who obviously I've idolized my name off of. Uh, uh, be, be great next time I get a chance to meet the man to um, get his blessings. Um, but yeah, you know, he, he still wants to do his thing in sports, uh, generally in sports. As he mentioned, college football and to do his thing uh, in pro wrestling, which a lot of us got to know him from in pro wrestling. But uh, Jim Ross always had a, a great passion for football, college football to be exact. You know, he's a, he's a boomer sooner <laughs> out of Oklahoma City. And um, if things work out between him, himself, and AEW, it could probably be a similar deal that uh, more Ronaldo has with the WWE or specifically NXT. He, he would do the big-time pay-per-views, takeovers, and his um, weekly, uh, po- uh, not podcasting, uh, telecasting with NXT TV and balance that out with uh, boxing, Showtime Boxing. And I believe... Uh, He's done uh, of the broadcasting. Oh my God, was who was it? Was it with Fox or the USA Network? There was a recent boxing event on TV. I, I just can't remember the uh, the network it was on. But Mauro Ronaldo was commentating, and he he would have a great fit if he wants to return to uh, MMA broad, uh, broadcasting. He just has the voice and the talent for it. But hoping one day that. Uh, I'll have my personal dream team of Jim Ross and Mauro Ronaldo calling a main event wrestling match one day, but here's to hoping. 
a major update for the G1 Supercard with uh, Ring of Honor and New Japan Pro Wrestling set for WrestleMania weekend at Madison Square Garden as the RRH World Heavyweight title was originally scheduled to feature Jay Lethal taking on Marty Scroll, but that has been changed to a triple threat ladder match that would include Matt Taven. Uh, Matt Taven had a title match with uh, Jay Lethal for the RRH World title back on the 17th anniversary RRH show, but that match went to a 60-minute draw. So, of course, neither man won or lost the match, but Taven feeling that he deserves a title match, he was inserted into the uh, main event ROH match for the G1 Supercard and has not become a triple threat match. So as of this past Monday, the current G1 Supercard card is as follows as Jay White defends against a yet-to-be-named opponent who shall be the New Japan Cup winner as White will defend the IWGP Heavyweight Championship one-on-one. For the IWGP and the Ring of Honor World Tag Team Championships, the Gorillas of Destiny will take on the Villain Enterprises. For the IWGP Junior Heavyweight Championship, Ishua Mori defends against Dragon Lee and Bandido in a triple threat match. For the Never Openweight and Ring of Honor TV Championships in a title-for-title unification match, Will Ospreay will take on Jeff Cobb, champion versus champion. In a New York street fight, Bully Ray will take on a yet-to-be-announced opponent. Rush will go one-on-one with Dalton Castle, and we will see a Honor Rumble match. Yet to be determined the stipulations or what the winner will receive after this match. During Triple A's Ray the Ray's 2019 event this past Saturday. What began as a rumor, the Young Bucks were in Mexico, but were not expected to compete at all, anywhere, for anyone. So after Phoenix and Pentagon Jr. defeated, translated the Mercenaries tag team of Ray Scorpion and Texano Jr. for the AAA World Tag Team Championships, all of a sudden after the match, we see Conan and the AEW executive presidents, the Young Bucks, challenge Phoenix and Pentagon for the AAA tag team titles right there and there. But of course, they just went through a long and tiring match as the Lucha Bros ran on fumes and were defeated by the Young Bucks, who were their very same opponents for all or nothing. And the Young Bucks became the new AAA tag team champions as an upset, a complete upset heading into the pay-per-view all or nothing. So quite a turn of events here, as um, it's expected uh, to have multiple organizations involved with All or Nothing, or at least talent from multiple organizations. And this also confirms that, at least having Triple H involvement, similar to what All In had with Lucha Underground, New Japan, Triple A, among other places, uh, Impact, so... Yeah, this is how pro, uh, this is how a pro wrestling company should be, thus g- getting me even more excited to catch this event live on television or on pay per view or streaming, whichever way I end up watching it. Becky Lynch should be honored as a hero this week on Raw, but because she's kind of a face heel, heel face. Uh, over the weekend during a meeting greet, a fan suffered a seizure, as as one witness shared on Twitter, a girl had a seizure in line at the signing. Uh, started shaking uncontrollably and couldn't make it up the stairs. And Becky Lynch ran and held her as tight as she could for like about five minutes until it completely stopped. Another witness shared, uh, Becky continued to sit with the fan after the seizure had concluded to make sure everything was okay and that the fan was feeling better. So, assumingly by by those accounts and how Becky Lynch um, reacted, uh, she might have had experience with this. Maybe with a loved one, maybe with a friend. Uh, there was no public comment about or from Becky Lynch about this incident. But uh, glad to hear that the uh, fan was feeling better, a young girl. And that the meet and greet continued. Of course, this unfortunate incident prolonged everything, but for good reason. And I'm glad to hear uh, uh, scenarios like this where 
the said guest, or in this case, the athlete or the wrestler, Becky Lynch, jumped into action without hesitation or, you know, uh, quietly walking away because they, they didn't know what to do. I mean, that would have been a bad look. But kudos, and uh, thankfully Becky Lynch knew what to do then, and that the fan is doing much better. Ashley Mossara, who I, uh, you know, on, uh, on occasion run into in New York when I make my trips up there on, on a regular basis throughout the year, uh, on a possible comeback to pro wrestling, she announced on Twitter that she'll be taking training at the New York Wrestling Con uh, Connection, but no word if it's going to be a return to the WWE or to any other company. But it sounds like she has the old itch to step back into the ring, and she's going to take up on her training again. Uh, she looks great physically. Uh, looks like she uh, has taken care of herself throughout the years since leaving the WWE. And, you know, you know, bless her heart. Try to stay relevant as much as possible, and the fans do remember her. She does get a great um, outgoing and support at these uh, meet and greets in New York where she uh, does a lot of appearances for. And you know what? I hope it works out for her. And that if it is uh, the WWE, well, some new faces, even though where there were previous ones, won't hurt to spice things up a bit, especially in a roster that's been uh, lackluster, to, to say the least. NXT has signed Garza Jr. and Shane Strickland. Both men are expected to report to the Performance Center on April 9th. This is the second time, matter of fact, that Garza has signed with the WWE uh, about a year ago. But it was next due to a shoulder injury. But this time he has passed all medical tests and was given a brand new spanking contract. The initial signing led to a nasty scenario between himself and MLW as Court Bauer alleged that the uh, that he, being Garza, blew off pre-tapes to meet across time with WWE talent negotiations. Bauer will go, will go as far as making a statement that this was a sketchy move by WWE. Uh, we, we never got to find out the entire circumstance. Uh, if there was a loophole source from, uh, from MLW's contract with Garza. Speaking from a legal standpoint, um, Garza would have had to have some kind of permission or an okay from someone in MLW to free him up long enough just to have these negotiations. But if he was signed in an ironclad contract with MLW, and a no point states that, yeah, you could uh, speak to anyone uh, outside of MLW, you know, go to WWE or Impact or whomever, but just let us know. That way, that would have given MLW some time and effort to put together and try to make uh, Garza happy to stay. But this never came to be. And I believe this is when and where, you know, after this situation, MLW added. Uh, a clause in the contracts where once on the contract, you're not allowed to speak with anyone, including specifically WWE, to negotiate any kind of deal with, uh, even by the time the contract is expiring, either it's completely expired or you're terminated, but at no point, as long as you're under the MLW banner, you cannot talk to anyone, especially WWE for their shady and sketchy tactics that they pull. Unfortunately, at the end of the day, it is a business, and I've been a victim of that myself, and it's hard not to take it personal. NBA Portland Trail Blazers' Ennis Kenter sat down with Hoops Rumors and, among other topics, shared his passion for the WWE, saying that, I am very serious about it. I feel like it's my world. You just got to go out there, talk trash, troll people. Lifting, I love lifting. It's just fun. I don't want to stop my sports career when I'm done with basketball. For a lot of people going to broadcasting, coaching, but I want to continue up opening the doors in sports. That's why I'm very serious about it. I'm already in contact with Paul Heyman and some of the wrestlers, and I'm actually meeting with Vince McMahon. Oh, well, at least he's trying to get a meeting with Vince. Uh, and this uh, Cantor or Cantor individual, he stands at six foot eleven. Weighs about 250 pounds. May not be uh, built like a uh, like a Triple H physique-wise or a Batista or a Cena. But he's got the height for it. 
And Vince has always liked big men. At six eleven, um, he, he more he more has a, uh, has the physique of a uh, of a giant Gonzalez. Ironically, Gonzalez used to be a former basketball player for the NBA, and um, but still not as uh, uh, bulky as uh, Gonzalez was. But I say, hey, these uh, these crossovers, these uh, these open doors, so to speak, these open opportunities to uh, cross over from one sport to another. It's probably one of the best things that could happen to an, to an athlete. Uh, look at Bo Jackson. He tried to balance a career between baseball and football. Uh, Bobby Lashley did MMA for Bellator and Impact Wrestling. Look at, uh, well, probably the worst example, but he's still getting paid large sum. Lesnar balancing his WWE career and his somewhat UFC career. That is, yo, that is still yet to get off the ground, but it probably won't probably won't do so. Going on Dana White's recent interview, that his next fight won't be until the summer. So, Daniel Cormier can go ahead and retire, vacate his world title, and more than likely we're going to end up getting Lesnar versus John Jones. Uh, speaking of af- outside athletes joining the pro wrestling world, former UFC world champion Frank Mir. He's going to have his first uh, pro wrestling match, and his opponent was revealed by Josh Barnett's uh, Twitter account that Frank Mir will go one-on-one with another UFC legend and Hall of Famer and former UFC heavyweight champion, Dan the Beast Severn, at the Game Changer Wrestling event on April 4th, streaming on Fight TV. Frank Mir has uh, had a few, among other fighters, have had training sessions at the Performance Center in Orlando with the WWE. And wow, I mean, the, the, these crossovers continue to go on. Some of them under the radar for some reason. Uh, I, I guess not to get too many people excited, but but the possibilities are there. Our Mir would, would hang out backstage at some of the events. Also, a good segue here, former UFC heavyweight champion Cain Velasquez is going to try his hand on pro wrestling as well. According to the Pro Wrestling Insider, Velasquez is another UFC or well, former UFC champion that's been training at the Performance Center and open to a possibility. I mean, this been talks before. Nothing's been set in stone yet. But according to the Wrestling Observer, they say obviously UFC would have to okay this for contract reasons, but there is significant talk of Cain Velasquez doing some high-profile pro wrestling this year. Cain has been training, once again, at the WWE Performance Center before, and says that he would treat pro wrestling with respect. And if I didn't, if I wasn't a fan of Cain Velasquez before, I'm definitely am of him now by making that comment. And obviously a fan when he was growing up and went a different route when he decided to go into the UFC or, or an MMA in general. But um, I, I, I welcome more of this. I, we should see more of this. I, I'm not saying for all of the veterans in the UFC – that they want to still be physical and do something noteworthy, that they should end all ties with UFC and jump over to the WWE because they'll get a different kind of recognition from the fans. But again, the transition and the open world uh, crossovers, it's an amazing thing. I mean, that's what I believe a lot of athletes hope to have an, uh, an opportunity for. I would. Opportunity is there, take it. After having an interview with uh, Wrestling Travel, and hopefully WWE was listening to this too, but Sting is willing to return to the ring for the WWE unless it's against The Undertaker. Even Sting still believes that this dream match can still happen. Now, do we all expect a high-profile wrestling clinic out of this? No, but the visual itself and the reaction alone would be more than enough, personally. But I know I'm not, I, I know I'm not alone in this. To see Sting, the Dark Crow version of Sting, face to face with the Undertaker, and yes, there is a height uh, difference. But these men have worked together before, a long time ago, at, at a WCW house show that was never uh, that was never recorded, unfortunately. Unless there's some fan footage out there that's willing to uh, donate 
set footage to the to the WWE Network. But they they have to do this. I mean, obviously, as, as time goes further, uh, the more wasted opportunities that there is. But just get off your ass, WWE. Just let it happen, Vince. Creative. I mean, you're worried about making them happy mostly than than, than you do the audience. But there has to be at least one fan among the creative team that still says, hey, let's make this happen. Let's focus on this. Let's work, or let me do it on my own. I'll take it to the old man and get him to approve it. Otherwise, Sting is on a contract getting paid by WWE for doing absolutely nothing. Sting does, yeah, meet and greets, makes appearances, he goes to Comic Cons and all this. But for WWE, other than he's in a, a, a talent, a signed talent, he's doing nothing. His doctors cleared them. His doctors cleared them, not WWE doctors. That's because they don't want him to get in the ring and have that accidental bump to the neck or to the head area. And, uh, you know, it's deja vu all over again from the champions. But this match should happen come hell high water. Moving along. Robbie E. debuted at an NXT house show in Stanford. Now going by Robert Stratus, no relation, as he, now, as he is now the manager of Rinku Singh and Savari uh, Gujar. I know I butchered those names and I apologize. But uh, he's dressed in the, well, he was dressed, assuming this is what he's going with forward, uh, in the plaid suit and the pants, uh, well, they, they, they didn't fit. It, 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 it almost looked like Urkel pants. And. <laughs> <laughs> Far cry from his, uh, I guess, spin-off character, Robbie E. from uh, uh, The Shore, whatever MTV show that was based on. Because, you know, reality shows always work. And they make great characters in wrestling. No, they don't. But great to see another um, star signed. Hopefully they'll know what to do with him than with any others mentioned so far and the ones yet to come. Because there may be room for a talent to, that's going to be signed up in the near future. But I'll get to that in a minute. As DJ Z has reportedly signed a deal with the WWE. As he has been a free agent since the beginning of the year after a nice run with Impact Wrestling. But as of this week, a contract has only been sent to Z. And the belief is that he may sign in the next few weeks. This all coming from the PW Insider. So there was a little bit of mis- miscue there. As DJ has not signed yet, but a contract is on the table and it's in the hands of DJ to see if he'll sign or not. Carl Anderson and Luke Gallows have been pulled from upcoming scheduled WWE events, reportedly due to ongoing contractual renewal issues with the WWE. Once again, from PW Insider, it's reported that the tag team of uh, Gallows and Anderson were removed because of their decision to turn to turn down a reported five-year contract extension. It was noted that the team is still in discussions about resigning, and they are not booked uh, for doing anything beyond TV tapings or pay-per-view events. They haven't been seen on WWE TV since around mid-February of this year, as their current contract is set to expire in late September. Another former Bullet Club member took a different route at, when it comes to his contract. AJ Styles has indeed re-signed with the WWE as he shared the news probably in one of the best ways possible by posting a pic of a, of a new family member, a nice little cute little puppy, and mentioned about signing the new contract, thus killing any and all rumors of AJ jumping to AEW in May as his old contract would expire in April. So... Kudos, thus seeing why he was uh, posted in a new high-profile feud with Randy Orton, heading into WrestleMania, and AJ Styles will luckily, luckily, hopefully, will get another title run because he re-signed with the WWE. Can't say the same thing about his uh, former Bullet Club members of Gallows and, and Anderson, unfortunately, but maybe cooler heads will, pre- will prevail if they come to some kind of uh, arrangement and agreement to have them stay with the WWE. At first, PW Insider reported that Sin Cara has signed an extension on his contract for about three years, 
running until 2022. But Sin Cara basically parodied AJ Styles' Twitter posting of uh, Chihuahua and said that he did not sign a new contract with the WWE. He has been sidelined since uh, late last year due to a knee injury, uh, but was spotted recently at the Performance Center, Sin Cara was, working on his rehab. So that's probably what his uh, focus is on, getting physically better. I mean, what's the point if you're not medically cleared to return to the ring and sign a contract? Saying common sense still works, people. Flip Gordon tweeted out that he's clear to return to the ring as he's been sidelined since January because of an MCL tear uh, from his match at Honor Reign Supreme. Hopefully there'll be enough time for him between now getting back into ring shape and have something for him at the G1 Supercard. After spending a few weeks as a consultant, it is now made official, as per PW Insider, that Dana Warrior is now a full-time WWE employee. The idea was to have Mrs. Warrior be contributing to storylines and provide a female perspective to the creative process on an ongoing basis. Um, I have heard that there were women on, on creative before and recently, and honestly, a lot that they've, that they've shown and and I, what we've heard on TV, on the WWE stuff, um, it doesn't seem like it. I mean, I just feel as, as scripted as a lot of the stuff is um, or everything is, especially when it comes to the women's roster, the, the, the material that they're given, like, like, for example, Nia Jax, how everyone's just, just bearing Nia Jax verbally anyway on, on social media and blogs. You know, I, I hear that. And, and just like a movie or just like uh, any TV role, you know, it, it's not Nia Jax's fault, not entirely. I'm, I know it goes a long way as well as far as the delivery. But if the delivery and the material is not matching or you're just not feeling it across the screen, then something is definitely wrong. Now, does that have anything to do necessarily with not coming from a woman's percept- uh, perspective? No, not entirely. But as a talent, and I don't know why this is not a bigger deal, that they can chime in with their ideas or their point of view. Like, okay, I, I you know, talking to creative, yeah, I see what you're saying, but um, uh, what, what, what if I, I approach it this way instead of that way? Because you know, I'm supposed to be upset here, but you're making it sound like I'm kind of joyful about this and not, not really giving two monkey craps about it. You know, I'm too happy when I'm supposed to be pissed off. And there've been stories plenty of times where creatives like, no, no, just do it, do it our way. It makes sense. It's, it's complete bullshit. But you know, I'm just saying, uh, someone like uh, Adina Warrior, who was not necessarily around the business, but married to a legend and Hall of Famer in the Ultimate Warrior, who I'm sure many a times have, have has had conversations about the inside of the business and how things are run and who to talk to and how to how to get things to get by and stuff like that. So having some knowledge and now been around backstage long enough to pick up the vibe and get the flow of things, I dare say uh, Mrs. Warrior is now an expert. And that's probably how the WWE saw that as well. So we'll see. Um, things usually don't uh, reboot, so to speak, until after WrestleMania, but with the, uh, uh, with the rehiring of Bruce Pritchard, uh, cu- curious to see exactly what angles he he's been uh, have been, has been attached to in the past couple of weeks, but um, yeah, Dana Warrior edition is a great one. And speaking of Miss Warrior, and I mentioned earlier that the new recipient of the Warrior Award this year, Sue Agenson, and as I mentioned, uh, had a uh, well mainly responsible for the connections with Make a Wish and has been a 30-plus year employee with the company. And this is what the Ultimate Warrior was talking about originally when he first suggested the Warrior Award in the first place, but he referred to it as the Jimmy Miranda Award. Uh, Jimmy Miranda was a longtime employee as well. He was the head of WWE Merchandising for house shows across the country, who unfortunately passed away back in 2002, but had a 21-year career with the WWE as an employee. 
since 2014, the WWE has taken the idea and renamed it the Warrior Award, as Dana White commented on the new recipient this year, uh, to help children and their families live better lives. She says, it's an incredible pr- privilege to present Sue with this year's Warrior Award. My, my husband saw Sue's effort firsthand through his WWE career. She displays the warrior spirit every single day and is an, an inspiration for us all. And yeah, I find absolutely no problem with this whatsoever. Not that people had problems with it before. The only issue was like, well, this is not exactly what the warrior talked about, but point taken. Would not surprise me if eventually we would get a, a reason why it was changed so slightly. Not uh, for for public reasons, or, or um, I'm sorry, for public relation reasons, why it was changed up a bit. But now, I think, well, like, well, maybe it's about time to actually present it to a person that was actually a WWE employee for so long that deserves it. And we will see that this year at the Hall of Fame. Adam Rose is about set to retire. He posted on his Instagram, I want to announce my full-time retirement from the wonderful world of professional wrestling. It's been a hell of a ride. I will be fulfilling all dates currently booked, but not taking any more bookings going forward. Thank you to the fans who supported me, the promoters who booked me, to all the good brothers and sisters who worked with me. Mainly thank you to the WWE for letting me, for letting a nine-year-old South African boy live his dream. My blessings and so much love to all. Goodbye and thank you. Adam Rose is a legit nice guy. I had the opportunity to run into him uh, a couple of years ago, and the sweetest guys can be. And it's unfortunate uh, things couldn't work out where he could have returned to WWE and maybe kind of have a, a feud of sorts with no, no Way Jose by stealing his his gimmick in a sense. But, uh, yeah, more, and more than likely he'll probably be available. Um, well, specifically bookings not for wrestling, but bookings for meet and greets. That's a whole different story. And hopefully uh, I can run into him in New York in the near future to let him know how much we appreciated his work and that um, he had a great career. An update on a story that I mentioned here a few months ago between Charlotte Flair's ex-husband, uh, Ricky Paul Johnson, who was suing Charlotte, Ric Flair, and the WWE regarding claims made about him in the Second Nature autobiography about Rick and Charlotte Flair's life and career. Johnson alleges that there were several false statements made about him in the book, including that he lost his job due to drug use, that he is sterile and unable to have children, as well as multiple false um, accusations, physical and or psychological abuse, which he believes he can prove to be false with police reports and dash cam footage. Interesting. PW Insider is reporting that on March 14th, the United States District Court of Western District of North Carolina granted Ric Flair and Brian Shields, who was the uh, uh, co-writer of the book and author of Second Nature, an extended time period to respond to the lawsuit. They will also have until March 28th to respond. However, on March 15th, Johnson was given the additional time to amend his complaint against WWE, Ric Flair, and Shields. Johnson has been given until March 22nd to file an, an amended complaint. If he decides to do so, the defendant's time frame will reset. An update on Sonny, who apparently has been incarcerated this whole time. I mentioned uh, a couple of weeks ago when I was in New York, she was scheduled to appear at a meet and greet with a uh, local vendor, but uh, he claimed that he never had her scheduled and didn't know why the promotion that was running the meet and greet had her advertised from said vendor. Uh, a couple of weeks before that, Johnny, uh, Johnny, <laughs> Sonny was uh, just imprisoned and during the meet and greet in New York was still incarcerated. And as per PW Insider, she was uh, extradited from Freehold, New Jersey's uh, correctional facility to the uh, Carbon County Correctional Facility in Carbon County, Pennsylvania, which took place this week as Sonny was arrested while driving while intoxicated last month 
With other outstanding warrants leading to her incarceration, Sonny's issues with the law have been well documented over the years, even as much as WWE trying to assist her. And it doesn't seem like this chapter is going to end anytime soon. Uh, to say that she's a hot mess is an, is an understatement. I mean, I give her the benefit of the doubt to uh, you know get her stuff together, but you know I'm, I'm not saying that because I'm, I personally know her, but you know she's another human being, and you, you want to see the good come out of them. She has her reasons, I'm sure, why she does what the things she do, but after a while, you don't want to say I'm giving up on you, but quietly walk away. And still quietly hoping that things work out for them. But you just won't be around to see it. Bit of a good news here. Ryan Satin reported that uh, Stephanie McMahon and Triple H made a huge donations of $1 million to a children's hospital in Pittsburgh. According to local affiliate KDKA, the, the donation will help establish a family-centered MIBG therapy suite at UPMC Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh. The only one of its kind in Western Pennsylvania, MIBG, stands for Meadow Iodo Benzo Guanity, and I hope I pronounced that right, is used to treat high-risk neuroblastoma. This is a aggressive cancer of the nerve cells that spreads quickly and is mostly found in children under the age of five. According to the report, Triple H and Stephanie attended a ribbon-cutting ceremony on Thursday at the UPMC Children's Hospital to celebrate the generous donation. So, yeah, we, we all hear stories of how generous and nice and wonderful Stephanie and Triple H are outside of the business, outside the ring. Uh, I don't know. The report doesn't mention exactly if they were in character or if they were themselves the people, the human beings of Paul Levesque and Stephanie McMahon. But either way, it's sometimes you, you buy into the characters on television, especially the Stephanie character, and how devious and scandalous. And, and she, she had a T-shirt during the Attitude I ever made that basically calling herself the bitch. So it's hard to argue that. But uh, <laughs> um, on the flip side, it's great to see something like this. And we all want to do our part. We all want to do something, give back in a sense. Even if this is not something you've gone through yourself personally or know someone that has, but the fact that it's children that are sick and insurances and hospital can only do so much and a, a donation, uh, obviously not everyone can cough up a million bucks out of their pocket, but a donation of any kind, knowing that it'll go to a good cause, uh, will, give such a, will give you such a great feeling that, uh, yeah, you know, not all of us can be the assholes that uh, maybe at one time you were portrayed at, but portrayed as. But um, good to know that there are still people, there are still good people in the world. With that said, I'll end with this. And unfortunately, not a good person, at least at the time of an incident that took place, was uh, Eric Engel, brother of Kurt Engel from the WWE. I'm sure you have, I'm sure most of us are familiar with uh, Eric Angle, who posed as a literal stunt double for Kurt when it came to retaining the WWE Championship either against The Undertaker or, in one case, against Brock Lesnar on an episode of SmackDown. But he was charged, Eric was, with assault in relation to an incident that involved a, um, one of his students. He is a coach of, of uh, amateur wrestling during a junior wrestling tournament. And I one, one eyewitness said that Angle picked up a young wrestler by the neck after a loss and ended up letting the wrestler fall to the mat. And this video of this, you, you just go to YouTube, enter Kurt Angle, and more than likely it'll be the first video because that's the one that's been going viral. And the video obtained by WTEA, I'm sorry, WTAE in Pittsburgh, uh, obtained the video by the network and showed the incident in question. Charges were filed against Angle by the University of Pittsburgh Police. Eric Angle has since apologized and offered a statement saying, 
I wish I just walked away and let him get thrown out. Instead, I'm the one who's embarrassed even more so of the incident. Uh, Eric Angle has also commented on the matter, saying that he attempted to keep the boy from messing up and, and, and ended up making things worse. If you haven't seen the video yet, uh, I, I would have to say, uh, viewer discretion is advised. It's not, it's not every day. Well, I'm sure things like this happen on a regular basis. We just don't hear about it. But it's not every day that we see something like this, let alone had it captured on video and then posted online. Um, if, there's not, if, this, if this is not your cup of tea to uh, watch an adult put his hands on a young child and basically uh, be rough with the individual, uh, don't watch. Um, if, if the description I just gave out was more than enough, then I wouldn't recommend watching this. But for those, for curious sake, you know, you, you, you're more than free to watch, but not so much just to crank numbers and uh, make the video go even more viral, make it, make it get more hits for whomever has been uploading it. But just to see, you know, the, the ugly side of human nature. You know, I go from a story about $1 million being donated to a children's hospital to a story of one individual choking and tossing a young child because they lost a wrestling match. We are better than that. Try not to get your emotions get the best of you in certain situations. Uh, it's, it's not always easy to say, like, wait till you're alone, wait till it's more private and intimate, because even then you can get into some kind of trouble because someone is always going to say something. So with that said, I want to thank everyone for joining me on the Jam Report. WrestleMania is coming soon, and I expect that to be a very long episode within itself when, when it comes time to review it. But for now, everyone, if you have already, you're going back to school soon. Everyone else, enjoy your upcoming spring break. I know I'm enjoying mine. So until next time, everybody be safe and be good, and I'll see you then. Open my eyes